it's 11 o'clock, I think we can get started. Uh, thank you all for coming to our biannual honors symposium. Uh, I am Michael Fratel, I am an associate professor of English here at the college, as well as the coordinator of the honors program. And today we have two students who will be completing uh, the final step in the honors process, which will be to uh, um, present to the college their final capstone research project. So let's get started with our first honors student, Ivy Henry. So essentially, if you have a higher temperature, 
like an artificially increased temperature, you can have an artificially decreased level of dissolved oxygen. So again, it's going to cause a huge amount of die off in the population. And just like pH, most organisms also have a very narrow range of temperature in which they can thrive as well. And again, going out of that range in either direction is going to directly impact their health. Uh, temperature can be anthropogenically increased, like caused by people increase um, through a lack of stage, through stage four station, uh, through wastewater release from power plants. You can see this diagram right here that people do use cooling towers at power plants to kind of like cool down the wastewater they use before they release it through water waste, but it's not always 100% effective, unfortunately. And you also have runoff too. So if you have, say, heated up blacktop, for example, and you have rainwater that hits that blacktop, What's going to happen is that rainwater is going to absorb the thermal energy from that blacktop as it runs off into surface waters. It's going to carry that thermal energy with it and therefore increase the temperature of the water. Uh, less often, water, can also, uh, water temperature can also be decreased through uh, water released by reservoirs as well. Uh, you also have heavy metals that I'll focus on here as well. Um, heavy metals, as defined by one research paper, are naturally occurring elements that have a high atomic weight and density at least five times greater than that of water. Oh, you can see the list in red right here, this diagram right here. But you can, uh, heavy metals also include select metalloids as well. Um, some heavy metals are like essentially in pretty small amounts, and they're like toxic in higher concentrations, such as copper and iron. And others are toxic in pretty much regardless of concentrations, such as aluminum, mercury, and lead. Uh, heavy metals have um, many origins, such as weathering and ozone and runoff. We have uh, certain geological formations that are pretty rich in these metals, but their sources are mainly anthropogenic, such as mining, fossil fuel combustion, and traffic, fertilizers and pesticides, and those in some yards, and also wastewater treatment plants, subject systems, and sewage sludge dumping. Uh, that is probably for lack of a better term, the most popular heavy metal, because it's pretty well known that lead poisoning is a pretty huge issue. You can see all the symptoms in this diagram right here. Um, lead poisoning is pretty problematic because you can cause a lot of neurotoxic infection symptoms, such as human loss, hyperactivity, low IQ, and learning disabilities. But it can also cause issues with pregnancies, such as miscarriages and premature births and stillbirths. And it can also cause hypertension in select individuals as well. You also have mercury as well, which is also pretty heavily toxic. Um, it can cause a huge variety of damages, such as damage to the kidneys, damage to the nerve system, damage to the cardiovascular system, and, and damage to like, developed fetuses as well. So if you have a fetus in the womb exposed to mercury, it's going to you know, have stuff like cognitive damage, fetal palsy, and normal delays. Uh, Mercury is also especially problematic because you can bioaccumulate the system too, which pretty much means that you can see this diagram right here. If you have one organism that consumes mercury, then you have another organism that consumes that organism, then you have another organism that consumes those two organisms, you can have mercury kind of like go up the food chain as you have um, organisms consuming other things that also consume mercury, and eventually it's going to go all the way up to humans. Aluminum is also pretty heavily toxic, it can cause neurotoxicity, especially in humans. It can also disrupt iron regulation, deposit on the gills, and just like mercury, it can also bioaccumulate into the food chain. As you can see, this diagram right here can also impact the fertility of this as well by decreasing fertilization, decreasing the hatching rate, and decreasing the amount of normal water it actually has as well. You also have iron, which that isn't necessarily toxic, but it can deposit on the gills, you can see in blue right here, as well as depositing on the stream beds. It's, it's problematic because you can smother anything that lives in the sediment with benthos. Um, iron can also disrupt iron regulation from the body, particularly that of sodium. And then you also have copper, which is pretty heavily toxic just in general. According to EPA, it can cause alterations in brain function, alterations in endocrine activity, alterations in blood chemistry, alterations in metabolism, and just general mortality. You can see this picture right here that exposure to copper has caused a ton of deformities in the gills, such as like degeneration of certain body parts and stuff. Um, so, the methodology that I use is actually. Um, Study these parameters in uh, these, this general area. Um, I took samples from like eight different sites and claimed these plastic water bottles and did it three times in the year once in May, once in August, once in November. The temperature of both the water and the air are taken on site using a glass thermometer, and all of the parameters are measured in lab using a hat penetrating phosphate test kit, a vacuum creates probe, a verified water test kit, and a vacuum filtration process for E. coli. Well, so you can see the nitty gritty here if you're interested, but all you really need to know is I took the average number of colonies instead of like the exact number of colonies. So just keep that in mind. We'll see you there later. You're only going to see like an average number, approximate number of colonies instead of like the exact number. Um, you can see the sites mapped out here in red, number in order of collection. So you have like site number one right down there, site number two right over here, and so on and so forth. Site number one is the Steel Creek Fuzzy Access Site, Illy, which is by the Steel Creek. Number two is, is the Ilian Marina, which is by the Mohawk River. Number three is the Captain Samuel Major Infancy Access Site in Hebrews, which is by the Mohawk River. 
Number four is by the middle of the road up in New Falls, by the West Canada Creek. Number five is the Franklin Green, which is also by the Mohawk River. Site number six is by the Oneida River, which is the West Authority of Cycle Center in Utica, which is by the Mohawk River. And site number seven is in Dr. Park in Utica, which is by the South Factory Creek. And site number eight is in Jason Island in Mohawk, which is by the Mohawk River. You can see the temperature here is pretty average. There's no real anomalies. It follows the same general trend you'd expect temperature to follow, being highest in the summer and lowest in the spring and fall. But you can see site one is in like aqua, is like it's, it's like um, capacity the lowest among all the seasons. And that's due to like a variety of reasons. One of them is going to be the state, especially with site one, since site one is the most heavily stated out of all the other sites. You also have differences in depth as well, since for example you have site three, you have site two is a lot more shallow than all the other sites, and of course you have less water that's spread out more thinly, it's going to heat up a lot more. We also have heat capacity as well, which is where this table comes in. You see here, heat capacity is essentially the uh, amount of energy that something has to absorb when we go up in Celsius to be, or the amount of energy that we must lose to go down in Celsius to be. And you can see in light blue that the air temperature in those sites, in those samples, was always like higher than the water temperature. And that was because the water didn't have time to really absorb all the thermal energy it needed to really get super warm. But you can see here in, uh, in the dark blue cells right here, which is kind of low contrast on that screen, but probably be the darkish. Uh, you can see that the uh, water temperature is actually higher than the air temperature this time, so vice versa. And that's because those samples are taken after a period of hotter weather. So essentially the water absorbed a ton of film of energy and didn't really have time to lose it by the time it took those samples. And that's because water just has a very high heat capacity in general, so it tends to take a lot of energy to like, go up and down on one Celsius degree. For PAs, it found a pretty similar trend of being highest in the, in the summer and lower in the spring and fall. You can see in green, it's within EPA limits, so there's no real concern there. But you can see site 7 is pretty much the highest out of all of them, so green is the most basic out of all of them. And there's a variety of reasons for this variation that we can see. Um, in terms of site 7, you particularly have runoff again from asphalt, since it's a pretty heavily urban area. But you also have less carbonic acid being present as well. So, Again, you have less carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the water, since again, the water was the hottest in summer, and as it gets warmer, it dissolves less uh, gases, so it's going to dissolve less carbon dioxide. As you see this picture right here, that means you have less carbon dioxide that can react to form carbonic acid, so it's going to be a lot more basic. And you also have more carbon dioxide being absorbed by plants, since we have photosynthesis coming in. So you have um, the plants kind of assimilate the carbon dioxide from the tissues in the process of photosynthesis. And that, again, is going to have less carbon dioxide being free in the water that actually reacts to form carbonic acid. It's again, going to be a lot more basic. In organic nutrients, you can see here there's some variation in nitrate, but it's universally below EPA limits, so it's, it's of no concern. But phosphates, however, are universally above EPA limits, of so 0.05 milligrams per liter. But again, there's still a lot of variation here, as you can see. There's a variety of reasons for this variation that we see as well. Um, we have increased agriculture activity, since if we have um, more fertilizers being applied, you can have more fertilizers that can run off into the environment, especially in waterways. You also have uh, nutrient uptake by plants as well, as you can see in this diagram right here, of both aquatic plants and of crop plants. If you have more plant growth, they can assimilate those nutrients more, so you can have less nutrients actually in the water. You also have organic fissing bait as well, so if you leave that stuff in the water behind for the decompose, you know, like release some nutrients into the environment. In terms of phosphates in particular, you also have bodin, since a lot of people use like uh, detergents to clean the boats, and a lot of those detergents are not phosphate free at all, so that's going to increase phosphate levels in the environment as well. For heavy metals, you can see it's pretty varied when it comes to lead levels. Some of them are above EPA guidelines, such as sites 1, 4, and 5. Some of them are below EPA guidelines, such as sites 7 and 8, and all the rest are pretty borderline. Uh, for iron, they're all universally below EPA guidelines, there was some variation. For copper, below guidelines, there was some variation. It's kind of hard to see the variation with the copper gas, you clear it up, and you can see it varies a lot more than it did with iron. For mercury and aluminum, they're both below EPA guidelines, like exactly zero parts per million for both of them, so there's actually no concern at all. There's a variety of reasons why these heavy metals can vary so much. Um, one, of them is, one of them is that there's a sedimentation and deposition, which is a whole bunch of complicated chemistry stuff I'm not going to get into. But it's pretty much you have the metals reacting with stable water, or like organic molecules, or just stuff in the sediment. And as it reacts with those things, it's going to become sequestered within different molecules and kind of deposit down, like you can see the iron hydroxide in this picture on the, on the right. And those still going to be present in the environment, the sediment is still going to be active in the water column, should be active if they say what's going to be collected. Um, for lead, you can have lead physics sinkers, if they're left behind in the environment, it's going to actually contribute to lead because they're made out of lead. 
carbon iron, you have scrap fractions, you have some car parts that are made out of those heavy metals and we just contain them. You know, so those cars are going to be used by you know, certain water, certain water which going to release heavy metals into the environment, which is then going to run off into the water. And for copper, you also have anti fouling paints, also in boats. As you see this picture on the left, like copper serves as a pretty solid vital side. It pretty much means it kills like, anything it touches, in terms of like, micro and stuff. And of course, a lot of people want to keep the boats clean, so they're going to be using anti fouling paints to sort of make sure you don't have stuff like bacteria or like barnacles and stuff going on the boats. In terms of E. coli, you can see they're mostly below E. coli limits, except for site number three, which is above E. coli limits during the fall. Um, you can also see that site six is among the highest, and they've already collected a uh, sample of fall, and they probably would have been among the highest in the fall as well. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for this to have happened. Um, we have sewage treatment, and we've seen this diagram right here, which is sewage treatment, that sewage sludge is disinfected. Um, it's unfortunately not always going to be perfect. You know it's going to have some bacteria slipped through the forbidden cracks in sewage treatment, especially with site number six. Due to this proximity to solid waste authority. Uh, you also have fertilizer use in general with animal waste as well. So, again, we have people usually saying manure to fertilizer fields, um, and that manure runs off in the waterway, it's going to carry a lot of E. coli with it as well. And you also have general animal waste as well. So, having more animals in the water, such as during summer before they migrate down south, or like, before, like during the fall, they're kind of fattening up, I guess, to migrate down south. I don't know how geese work. Uh, but pretty much, you're going to have, if you have more animals, you can have more waste, if you have more waste, you can have more E. coli, essentially. There's also competition on the of other microorganisms as well. Since a lot of E. coli that have become activated in the wild through its outside intestines, it can actually survive at fairly low temperatures sometimes compared to other microorganisms. So what's going to happen is that as your temperatures lower, you can have other microorganisms dying off. And as those microorganisms die off, you can have more resources that E. coli can use to actually thrive in their stem. That's all well and good though, but that kind of, this kind of uses you don't really go into like how you can remediate the ones that are kind of above your pH limits. Um, for phosphates, you can use phosphate free attention to clean your boats. Um, you can also use slow release fertilizers as well, which um, release, release nutrients a lot slower, so that way you can, um, plants can um, assimilate those nutrients a lot quicker, pretty much like before they can actually assimilate to the environment essentially, like run off of the environment, I mean. For both phosphates and E. coli, you can remediate those levels by reducing fertilizer runoff. So, by using riparian buffers, which you've seen this diagram right here, essentially just strips of vegetation along waterways that can reduce erosion and runoff, as well as both um, reducing the amount of tilling that you use as well, because again, it can reduce erosion, it reduces runoff, therefore it leads to less fertilizer running off into the environment. And you can also, like, if you have sewage on your boat, you can dispose of them off shore instead of, like, within waterways as well, so you can also reduce phosphate E. coli levels. Um, Though it's kind of, I know it's technically illegal to like release stuff into release sewage into like rivers and stuff. There's some people who don't do it anyway. So we just if we just knock it off, we fight in that department. And so phosphates and lead, we can impact both of us by changing how you actually fish. So for phosphates, instead of using organic bait, you can use a plastic and wooden fishing weights. And for lead, you can use tungsten fishing weights instead of lead fishing weights. They're a bit more pricey than lead. They are also lead free, so that's definitely the plus. It also begs the question, too, of how is everything else actually within the EPA limits? For some of them, there could just be no sources of pollutant at all, such so as temperature, pH, mercury, and aluminum. And for others, those uh, pollutants could have already been addressed. So, for example, if you have nitrates, they could just be using uh, fertilizers that contain fewer nitrates than usual. And for iron and copper, they could just not be present in the environment in uh, concentrations that are problematic. But they could also have been actively remediated as well. So. You can remediate uh, heavy metal like concentrations in the environment through doing stuff such as removing contaminated soils or phytoremediation, which is essentially the process by which plants assimilate heavy metals within the tissues so it doesn't run off into the environment. As you can see this diagram right here. Uh, whether those things are kind of planted there, they express purpose of phytoremediation, or just kind of do their kind of by happenstance that's happened to assimilate these heavy metals is kind of unknown, but it is something that can happen. Uh, so essentially, water quality in the um, area is pretty decent. Um, all phosphates are well above EPA standards, but in some E. coli and lead above standards as well. But everything else is within the guidelines, so for optimal water quality. And we just try our hardest to work together that we can fix everything that's already tend to be an issue. Are there any questions? Especially in site number one, but 
I kind of didn't expect metrics to be below EPA limits that much at all. I kind of expected them to be a lot higher than that, like phosphate squid. But um, beyond that, I don't think it really had much of a hypothesis. It's kind of got just seeing, hey, what's up with this area? I want to see what's up with it. You know what I mean? Anything else? Bioaccumulate has been shown to not be in the waterways here. So, like, so like aluminum and mercury aren't, aren't, even, aren't even present, so you can eat them just fine. If that makes sense. Yeah. There's the DEC water website you can check to see if you can eat the fish out mm -hmm. of the waterways. Do they want to make sure? Yeah. <laughs> just I know. Know. I'm like, I'm yeah, just DEC a lot more than my positive balance thing because I'm just very used to it. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah? What was your favorite part of the project? Uh, probably doing stuff in the lab, honestly. It was, it was just cool science stuff. It's like, cool, I get to put stuff in water and watch it change color. It's so awesome. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for the phosphates and the nitrates, you used the hatch kits. Did you yes, also, I did. How did you do it for the iron? Um, I used the verified water test kit. It's essentially like a strip of paper that you put in water and it like, changes color depending on the concentration of how many metals. It's not really precise, but it gives you a nice ballpark of how many metals you have in the water. Is it the same for the lead and the mm -hmm. copper? All the iron metals measure the same way. Okay. Very cool. All right, I guess that's it. Well, oh, thank you for hearing me out. Great job. <laughs>
culture while affected scientists more the technology. Okay, so what is the power of digital communications? Research, a researcher named Albert Meridian, um, he was a social psychologist, he devoted more than 40 years studying the research of psychological, psychological skills. One of his important research was the 73855 tool of communication. And there he showed how visual communication is very important in our daily lives. So in the chart, you can see that 55% of the communication that we receive, that we receive is visual. So think about this. How influenced are we about with visual communications? If a person says, I'm fine, but you can see the body gesture, they're angry, you're more influenced by what they're doing than what they're saying. So persuasive strategies. Persuasion is using graphics and text to persuade people to think in a certain way or to advise them. Strategies are used in a variety to captivate the viewer. This can produce successful works that establish a company or brand's identity and affect the receiver to feel a certain way. Some of these strategies are as follows, using shapes and lines to outline, to outline relationships, using symbols and icons to make information more memorable, using visuals to tell stories, and using color to indicate importance and draw attention. Factors that affect the power of visual persuasion. The knowledge of the viewer affects the visual persuasion since it occurs within a context. So a graphic by itself contains no, no context or no power to persuade. But when we use visual persuasion, we are relying on the context of the audience to supply a vast amount of knowledge and to decode the visual and draw conclusions. So also, two people with different backgrounds can have different, can be influenced differently with um, the same message. Factor, another factor is the visual content. We have to know the content of the visual and what it depicts. The content of the graphic will support, can support the message in many ways. It can depict the product, show a unique feature, demonstrate a benefit, or several other possibilities. Something else is the graphic style. The way that a graphic is done affects the persuasive power of the overall message. A style that is congruent with the message will reinforce the message, but a, a a style that clashes the content, the content won't help with the visual persuasion. So graphic design as a visual communication. It is the business of making or choosing marks and arranging them on a surface to convey an idea. It is a solution to a specific problem and it is and it's responsible to transmitting a message in a unique way. Graphic design is successful when the receiver remembers what they saw. So its importance is that it creates identity. So when we think about Apple or Nike, for example, you can immediately see a pop, like a pop in your head about what they look like. So this is the power of it, it um, making the viewer remember these things. And it is important is that it's almost in every product that we interact with, starting with road signs, um, branding, ads. So they, like we mentioned earlier, they, they persuade us and they also direct us. So 
So the persuasive strategies are the elements of art and design. A lot of these are the focal point, the color, shape, space, balance, unity, and repetition. This creates persuasion by being influ influential, advising the viewer, and making you think or act differently. So focal point. So what is focal point? It is the center of interest, what catches the viewer's eyes. The purpose is to draw the viewer's attention to the most important element of a design. Um, it impacts the, the composition because it, it attracts people to, to look at that section and attracts the eye naturally. Um, one important aspect of focal point is hierarchy. <coughs> hierarchy is the way that the order of that we see things. And emphasis is created by visually reinforcing something we want the viewer to pay attention to. So for example, the, the first design we can, our eye automatically goes to the center of the picture because of the balance that it portrays. And on the bottom top one, we can, our eyes go directly to make art in life because of the transparency and color. So color, color can play a big role. The colors that are used in graphics, including logos and posters, evokes an emo emotional response to the audience. We all associate things or emotions with colors in a different way based on what we have experienced in our lives. Influential is it influential in persuasion because decisions are based on emotion, not logic. So how influenced we are by this, think of this. And there's also dualism in colors. Colors can have two seemingly opposite emotions. The meaning of colors can change if you use different situations or different things. A light blue can, con can convey innocence, purity, and peacefulness, while a dark blue can convey confidence and intelligence and masculinity. So here we have um, two different logos. We have McDonald's, and the colors are very influential because research has shown that warm colors like yellow and red increases heart rate and gives, um, makes the person hungry. It also creates emotion and joy. Um, the Whole Foods Market is green. It, it is a color that is very visible and it shows its freshness and nationality. Okay, so here we can see the same concept with different colors. We can see how the colors can impact the mood of a design. One can be very hopeful, one can be very mysterious, another one can be very peaceful, so that's how color can impact the design. Shapes. Another one is shapes, and they are used to transmit the viewer, transmit different fields, and provoke a response. Uh, shapes can organize the design's layout and composition. It also contributes to the hierarchy of elements present. Factors of shapes the influence in visual persuasion are that shape psychology and soft edges versus hard edges. So we can see how the circle can have softer or mild, milder edges. The square have more of geoma geometric shape. And triangle has polygon with three edges and they can be more dynamic. There is the natural shapes and also the abstract shapes. Okay, so how can shape organize? So we can see 
in the upper logo how different circles, how it's made up of different circles. And to the left, you can also see how different shapes are making up the total, like the entirety of the design. We can see also how, can, how shapes can make up a composition. So by looking at the, this design, we can see how it's separated into different parts, into three different sections. This creates hierarchy, and also we can see how it's separated into three different sections by using squares. So shape psychology. We can see here in this illustration how the truck is more, is the one the, that is influent, influencing the, the tree work because of the sharp edges versus the soft edges of the tree. Space is also very influential. It can create the visual essence and dynamic of the composition. There are two types of space. There is positive space and negative space. Positive space can be perceived as two-dimensional two or three-dimensional. It contributes to the hierarchy of elements in the of elements that's in the design. Positive space refers to the shapes of objects. It usually refers to anything that is considered the focus of the page. Negative space is the white space or empty space, which is the part of the design that is not there. The space between the visual elements. So I'm not sure if you guys can see how there are like two different um, people in the in both sides. So that's considered the positive space, and then the the negative space is the white area. Um, negative space is just as integral to the design as the positive space. Negative space is important because it helps frame and contain a composition, plus it also connects or disconnects shapes to suggest relationships between them. Negative space avoids visual clutter and looks clean, which can help balance the composition and help focus the viewer or something specific. At the end, this is what a good design is, simplicity and conveying a message. So we have space can be used in different ways, and these are like the techniques. Common place is um, the motion that we can see in a design. Closure is the when we when our eyes tries to fill in a, an area of a design. The one with the nest is uh, continuity, and it's when the elements are united with something, with a visual element. Proximity is when we, when different shapes are together, or different elements, we tend to think that they're grouped because of their closeness. Um, figure ground is when we tend to separate the figure and the ground, the subject and the background. Um, common region is also when things are grouped and we tend to um, pick out a specific part. And symmetry is basically when the composition is balanced. So very famous logos that use space is Spartan Golf Club. We can see two different different elements there. We can see a person with golf playing golf, and we can see, see the head of uh, a Spartan. And also we can see the Pittsburgh Zoo. Uh, we can see how there's a tree and different elements are there too. We can see a, a lion and the uh, gorilla and also the, the fishes in the bottom, in the bottom and birds in, at the top. FedEx also is very influential because of the use of space. You can see the logo in using figure ground relationship.
So what is balance? Balance in design covers how the visual weight of elements are balanced with each other in, on both sides of the design to create cohes cohesiveness, completion, and satisfaction. Why is visual weight so important? Just think about seeing a building, for example, or a house. If you see one part, like, going to one side, you're probably going to feel concerned and not going to go in there. So that's what happens with um, visual communications doing graphic design. By nature, the us humans are very attracted to things that are balanced. So to achieve optimal balance, a, com a composition should be balanced vertically, horizontally, diagonally, or background versus foreground. The importance of balance is that if designs will have a sense of balance, then the viewer's eyes won't know where to look at. And while you're trying to communicate, they might get across because different areas of interest can go easy, easily unnoticed. The elements that must be balanced to achieve the desired outcome include objects, colors, textures, space, still versus moving, and all of the principles that we are mentioning. So there are different types of balance. There is symmetrical balance, and there is asymmetrical, discordant balance, radial balance, mosaic balance, and the symmetrical is when both sides are of equal weight. Asymmetrical is when um, the weights are distributed, but still makes the design look good. Radial balance is similar to a snowflake. Mosaic balance then is when the elements are distributed, but they're still balance all over the design. This body balance is a little bit more, it's less bi balanced, but still gets the hierarchy and still doesn't make the viewer feel awkward. Um, famous logos that use balance is the Chanel logo and the Starbucks logo. You can see the symmetry in both sides, how they both have visual weight in both sides. So unity. Um, unity is the whole picture, bits and pieces, that represent the design style in its entirety. It combines objects, shapes, and elements, and it's more than a geometric, geometrically theory, but more of joining abstracts in such a way they form a pattern. Unity is when elements of the design support each other and create harmony. It creates balance by making all of the objects to help um, so that they belong to the design. Uh, we can see to the right different types of unity. There's repetition, proximity, alignment, and contrast. They work like a pattern, but still they create unity to the design. Typography. Typography is very influential in graphic design today. Um, it uses persuasive techniques by promoting legibility to make messages clear. It helps communicate the tone, messaging, and sentiment of the design. Typography is not just a text. Each font is different, carrying a unique attitude and conveying different messages. The principles of, this, of design apply to typography and allows to create both feelings with its aesthetics. Okay, so I made a visual story using typography. It's an intro of Finding Nemo. I will read to you guys and you guys, and you guys will see the visual story. So two clownfish, Marlin and his wife Coral, admired the view 
from their new home within a sea anemone overlooking overlooking the drop off of a coral reef below them their flush of eggs lies hidden in a small hole excited to be the first excited to be the it came out weird presenters today will be graduating, so I want to present them with their honors medal. So Ivy.
We have one more round of applause for our presenters. Thank you all for coming today, supporting the honors program. Before you leave, there are some light refreshments uh, in the back if you want, and uh, enjoy your day. Thank you.